ready to go. It's about to stream. Let's see if this works. And I will let you know if I see it. Hello, I think I see it. I see us there. Uh, live. Not love, we are live. And I'll put a direct link in there. Hello, everybody out there. Welcome to this special episode of what we call Brilliant Minds. And we are joined by someone who's certain to be a brilliant mind. I've seen a lot of his work and I've been meaning to meet him for a long time. I've actually seen and produced an event about you. Uh, or so, you know, including you and the Chasing Einstein documentary <clears throat> that we did. Say that again. Fantastic. Yeah. So we did that uh, about right before the lockdown started in uh, in March, I believe it was. Okay. We had a uh, an event here with Elena April and the Kai Shuan Ni, who's my colleague at UC San Diego. Um, that was Xenon One Ton Experiment, and then we had the filmmaker of the Chasing Einstein documentary, which is available on YouTube. Uh, and you can find it there. Maybe I'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, but it's none other than Dr. James Beecham, who is uh, calling us from uh, Central Europe, from the Czech Republic, what used to be called the uh, Czechoslovakia, I believe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I contacted James uh, for two reasons. One, I've always wanted to talk to you followed you online, not just for your um, contributions in physics, but also you have a very um, a strong gift at popularizing what's known as popularizing physics and making it accessible to the lay person and to the non-expert. I'm a lay person when it comes to high energy particle experimental physics myself. And so I find your TED Talks and your uh, public outreach talks that you've done, as well as your films. Uh, I believe you were, were you also in... Um, in uh, the, the, the particle fever. Particle fever. Uh, in fact, my name is in the credits. Um, long story on particle fever, but uh, I was in particle fever. In fact, before the Higgs discovery, particle fever um, was a totally different project. And they shot me and some other people on two completely separate occasions, two completely amazing things that because of the Higgs discovery didn't make it into the final film. So. Oh, that's funny. I, I know those guys quite well, but uh, yeah, my name's in the credits if you look closely. Oh, that's great. Um, good. So what we're going to do today is have a little conversation, which is prompted by uh, news from last Friday uh, in the uh, particle physics community about a future collider. And before we get to your opinions as an expert in the field, I thought it would be interesting for my listeners to get some uh, perspective from you as an expert in this field as to the importance of uh, these high energy particle physics experiments, how they work, at a basic level, why they're so important, uh, why we need another one, and why they are so darned expensive, and why we don't have them all in our in our basements. Uh, although I have a tiny little particle accelerator called a cathode ray tube that I keep around. Uh, but James, can you um, uh, you have some slides? I'm going to make you the co-host of this. Yeah, let me see. Uh oh, let's see if I can do this. Stop live stream. No. Oh, I got to go to participants. Bear with me, people. How many, it's only my how many physicists does it take to uh, operate Zoom? <laughs> it's only my fifth hour of Zooming today. This, <laughs> I, I used to joke that I studied the cosmic microwave background, and now I study the cosmic Zoom background. Uh, I bet you're in the same kind. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, you should have the power now to stream yes. live. Uh, so take it away, sir. Let's try here. What will it allow me to do? Ah, great. I should be able to share this, and you should be able to see some slides, yeah? Yeah, I see a, a large blue set of t alternating tubes. Yeah, exactly. What happens if I get a full screen? Does it ruin everything? Can you see things? I think I, I still see it. Uh, try advancing one slide just to make sure it works. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I've advanced one slide. Okay, great. Fantastic. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Great. Cool. Take it away, well, sir. Yeah, first of all, it's really great to be here. I'm really happy that uh, you uh, reached out to me um, because, you know, a couple of reasons. One is it's a very, very exciting time uh, in particle physics and just in physics and society in general. And, you know, the other part is, of course, that because of the pandemic, you know, my, my sort of like second life, the ho ultra hobby is like, you know, for, uh, talking to the public and that kind of a thing. And I haven't had a chance to do that for a while. So, <laughs> so this is a good uh, opportunity to kind of, you know, get back into that mode. Um, yeah, I've heard all these celebrities are all bummed out because, you know, the job of in in Instagram 
personality is not as lucrative as it used to be. <laughs> so. Exactly. No, it's, uh, it's part of it is, is gone. But I mean, so the, the, the you know, it's the most important reason why, you know, it's, it's awesome that uh, we get to have this conversation today is that from my perspective, you know, this kind of this, the CERN announcement on Friday that, uh, that they're seriously considering, you know, sort of like the, there's called this European strategy for the future of particle physics. It's this Europe, European version of, you know, something that's going on right now in the U.S. called the snow mass process, similar, similar to chart the course of the, the next, you know, half a decade, decades, many decades to come for particle physics and priorities. Um, and it's so exciting because what came out of that sort of prioritization document, a bunch of fantastic ideas that really deserve feasibility studies, like really honest to God feasibility studies. And that's really what we're seeing right now. And a lot of people in Europe, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm an American, but I've lived in, lived in Switzerland for like, what, six years now, right? And so a lot of people in Europe have been sort of like just twiddling their thumbs waiting for this type of thing to come out to really understand like, you know, what are going to be the priorities? And so you can really dive in to understand, you know, to, to work on some of these things. And one of the big, the big, uh, you know, the big ideas that they threw some weight behind was this notion of a future circular collider, right? So this is the FCC. I hope that they change the name when the future becomes the present, right? But the, uh, you know, the FCC is this idea of being something like, you know, a hundred kilometer new tunnel dug, dug on the border of France and Switzerland. You know, and it would be, it would hopefully reach something like a hundred tera electron volts and the current Large Hadron Collider gets to 13 tera electron volts. So this is something like, you know, four times as big a collider. It isn't even dug, dug yet. And it would reach something like six times the energies of what we can do right now at the Large Hadron Collider. And that, the prospect of that is absolutely mouthwatering. I mean, every particle physicist is like, oh my goodness, what could I do with this? Oh, it's so good to see the excitement around this idea. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and people have been thinking about it for a long time. And finally to see it sort of like get this sort of, it, it's weird because the, the, the European strategy, this document that came out, it's a little bit kind of, you know, it has to be somewhat judicious and diplomatic. So I can't say we're doing this. It's more like we should do, uh, it's a good idea to do a feasibility study about so-and-so thing. <laughs> and so this is the idea that now is, uh, you know, the, the FCC has kind of graduated from just an idea idea to like a real idea. And that's why it's so exciting right now, because the prospect of a 100 kilometer tunnel and a 100 TeV Hadron Collider is absolutely, you know, gobsmacking what you could do with this. And so that's why, for me, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, because right now in the history of science, I, as far as I can tell, there's never been a better time to be a physicist. There's never been a better time to be a curious human being. And if you're into if you're into you know concrete reasons and lists and things like that, it comes from this. Physicists, as you know, we're like problem solvers, right? We 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 see something that's weird and we go out and try to like figure out a reason for why. We're never satisfied with someone telling us, oh, that's just the way it is. That's completely dissatisfying. We don't we don't know. We want to know why. We want to know a mechanism. We want to test the hell out of it. We want to figure out all these things. And so that's why for me right now is an extremely important time, uh, exciting time to be alive because look at the number of burning questions and answers in physics that are open for us to, to address and to possibly solve in physics right now. And you see that this is basically the exact same list prior to 2012. 2012, of course, are the Large Hadron Collider is when we discovered this Higgs boson particle, this fantastic discovery that, you know, we, we something like 6,000 of us made, hooray. But again, the only, if you look closely at this slide, the very, very top right, uh, left corner, there's only one thing that has been checked off here. All the rest of these are completely open questions. And this is amazing because it also indicates that we have entered a brand new era in particle physics. We are no longer gu uh, guided only by theoretical considerations. And that's totally bizarre for people right now. And honestly, it's something that even experimentalists, we have to sort of like retrain our brains. We have to re recalibrate what it means to be a particle physicist because we were all raised on the same books and, and we, were, we were all uh, taught by the same textbooks that taught, taught, to teach about the history of 20th century physics where you know somebody will come up with some weird observation on a test tabletop experiment and then somebody, a theorist will say, hmm, that's interesting, maybe it means this. And then it'll go back and forth. And there was this kind of very clear flashlight as to where you should you know, build the next uh, uh, experiment to make the discovery. And it kind of happened just like clockwork throughout the 20th century. And it, it, this happened all over and over. You know, even into the, you know, the late 70s when these W and Z bosons, these particles that were completely game changers that it, it demonstrated the strength of this thing called the standard model, as you probably know, 
the standard model of particle physics that indicated that it's basically the set of equations that you can write down and you kind of turn the crank on them and they spit out precise predictions as to what you should see in particle physics experiments. And overwhelmingly, they're spot on. And it's such a successful theory. And you know, for example, it more or less predicted these W and Z bosons back in the 70s. And they were right there waiting for us. So this is sort of like clockwork. It's very much, it was very much theory driven for decades in particle physics, up to and including the Higgs boson discovery. Because as you know, in this 27 kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, you know, so let's back up a second. What is the Large Hadron Collider? The Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, buried about 100 meters underground. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets that we have to keep colder than outer space to accelerate protons. You're basically made of protons to almost the speed of light. And then we smash these into each other millions of times a second. And we collect a record of the debris that flies out and we build, the, build up the largest unique data set in human history. And we sift through this unique data set to try to find evidence of things we weren't expecting. And before the Large Hadron Collider in the same tunnel, we had something called LEP, which is the Large Electron Positron Collider. And this thing was looking very closely for a lot of things. And it started to see like a little bit of a hint of the Higgs, Higgs boson, but it was nothing conclusive whatsoever. And so this is sort of like the, the, it was, but a lot of the indirect measurements that the, the LEP was making and other Tevatron experiments and Fermilab and other things, a bunch of indirect measurements were suggesting to us that there should be a Higgs boson particle sort of just around the corner in energy. And that's just, it was, you know, it, but it was sort of just a suggestion, right? I mean, it's, it's more, more or less indirect suggestions, hints that we get from theory calculations combined with experimental uh, measurements, which is again, the whole history of the 20th century of physics was like that. So then everybody built this large Hadron Collider colliding protons instead of electron positron. And lo and behold, right around the corner, there was a Higgs boson particle about 125 GeV. Uh, oh, just for people, this is a nice animation. I hope you can see the animation. So this is really what it looks like, you know, uh, an animation for what the, the, the LHC really does. You take these protons and at some point you're going to zoom down inside like it's a Star Wars movie or something like that. Oh, here it comes. There you go. And again, so you accelerate these protons to almost the speed of light and they slam them into each other millions of times a second. In the place where you slam them into each other, you build a gigantic detector because quantum field theory magic is going to happen. And by gigantic, I mean gigantic. Like the one that I work on is called Atlas and it's six stories high and it's 46 meters long and it's, it deserves the name Atlas is gigantic. Uh, and you know, this, this is the type of the, the, the extent to which we have to go to collect all of this debris. And this is sort of like, you know, this is a, I put this up here just because it gives you a, a, you know, a sense of something we use a lot in our experiments or in our analysis called event displays. This is what you would, this is sort of like a, a this is in fact a rendering of what a collision looked like. So this is when uh, two protons, one came into the screen and one went out of the screen and they collided in the middle and they made this fuzz and a bunch of stuff flew out. So this is the sort of thing that we look at all the time. Um, and then, so, you know, a lot of this stuff is, it seems a little bit like arcane. Um, and before I get to the standard model part and why we need these sort of things, I'll just kind of like back up a second because, you know, you see, you hear about this sort of thing. You hear about why, you know, you, you see like, oh yeah, 27 kilometer tunnel, protons being collided together, blah, blah, blah. But in, the question should still be at the back of your head if you're not a, if you're not, uh, an, uh, you know, an expert, why are they doing this? <laughs> That's a very important question, right? And even though for me, you know, it, it, even me, I sometimes like to remind myself, even when I'm doing this for a long time, all of what we do is not so super arcane because at the end of the day, it all comes down to, for me, a sliced bagel. So I'm sort of an adopted New Yorker now. That's my home base back in the US. So I, I take a bagel and I cut it in half. And then I cut the half in half and I keep going. How far can I go? I get to a crumb. Can I cut a crumb? Yeah, I eventually get to a molecule. Can I cut a molecule? Yeah, there's atoms inside there. Can I cut an atom? Yeah, there's a nucleus and an electron. Can I cut an electron? It turns out as far as we know now, the answer is no. But can I cut a proton? Yes, it turns out the stuff inside of a proton. Can I cut the stuff inside of the proton? As far as we know now, no. So this is really the entire, it turns out that when you ask, just like a lot of physics, when you ask a seemingly uh, simple question, like how small can I cut anything? You're secretly asking a much more complicated question, which is what was holding anything together to begin with? And so then this is again, the thing I mentioned, the standard model, the whole interplay between theory and experiment in the 20th century led to this thing called the standard model of particle physics, which is really just this list of particles, known elementary uncuttable particles that we know exist and the ways that they interact. And that's pretty much it. 
And then this last missing piece, this was the thing that was missing, the Higgs boson. It was, just, it was predicted like in the 60s and people have been looking for it for a very long time and no one had any idea what it was gonna be because the standard model for all of its awesomeness, all of its successes, it made one, it was, had one really, really frustrating thing about it. It said that the Higgs boson exists, but it doesn't tell you anywhere about where it should be. And that's frustrating because that, that where it should be is related to its mass, you know, how, how massive a particle is, which is related to this Higgs field idea. But anyway, this last piece of the Higgs boson, of the standard model we plugged in was this thing called the Higgs boson particle. And it was discovered in 2012 and, you know, it led to a, a Nobel Prize for two white males. What else is new? And so, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is a fantastic discovery, but the problem is that we know for a fact that the, the standard model is incomplete. And I think you know this, and I think a lot of your, your, uh, your uh, you know, audience would know this too, but we know that it can't be the full and complete picture of, uh, of, of the universe. And so we go in search of these new particles that will help us explain some of the big open questions that we have in physics right now. And this really comes in the way we look for these things really comes down to Einstein, as you know. So this is E equals MC squared. This famous relation. So M is the thing that nature controls. Nature controls the mass of a particle. And as you know, mass for a particle is not the same thing that we use the word mass in like colloquial language. Like it's like, oh, look at that massive airplane. Mass for a particle is just an intrinsic property of a particle. It's like charge or spin. It's just a number put there by nature. We don't control it. We can only measure it. The part we can control if we work hard enough as physicists is the E part. And this is the energy or kinetic energy of particles that we can slam into each other. And so you see that when we're doing this, and sometimes you'll see it measured in TeV, like I said, you see that when we're doing this, what we're doing is we're going to extremely high energies to try to kick back into existence very briefly, particles that maybe only existed just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. That's, you know, I, I, again, I don't have to tell you, but maybe some of your audience will, you know, to remind them, the universe right now is extremely huge. And it's also on average, extremely cold. If I take a temperature, a thermometer, put it out into the outer space, it's gonna be extremely uh, low temperature, something like 2.7 Kelvin or something like that. That's very, very, very low energy. And on average, the entire energy of the universe is very, very low right now. But it was not always this way. We know that every the universe is expanding. You just run the clock back. At some point, back in the uh, back far, uh, you know, back in time, everything in the universe had to have been packed into a tiny, dense little area, or little little volume. And particles do not like it when you start to smack them together like that. They start to vibrate and they start to you know radiate and they start to you know go wild. And the average temperature of the universe goes very high. So there's this inverse relationship between temperature and energy. Temperature, or sorry, temperature and time. And temperature is related to energy. And when we go, that's what we do when we collide protons or anything in, the, in a collider experiment, we're briefly recreating the conditions of the universe as they were just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. So in, in fact, it is a sort of a Big Bang machine that we're doing, that's the reason. It's in a very controlled way. We're not gonna make a bl uh, black hole to suck in the earth or anything, but we can, we can slightly, hopefully coax into existence any particles that maybe the universe doesn't have so much use for right now that would help us explain the big open questions that we see right now. And so, you know, that's the kind of, that's, that's the reason why, in a, to answer your question, why we have to go to bigger machines because bigger machines, you know, you see in my slide right here, the Large Hadron Collider can get us to right there about what, 10 to the minus, what is it, 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 20 seconds, something like that. But that means that all the interesting stuff is back farther in time. We got to build bigger machines, bigger energies to ever hope to understand what was going on back at that moment. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else here. I can keep going, but. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say one thing, you know, just again, my, my role is both a cheerleader and uh, a gentle non-tomato throwing critic. Uh, often I've heard this, you know, we want to get back to the beginning of time. Of course, yeah, the highest energy ever, if we are, you know, right, as many cosmologists think that inflation took place, you're talking about, you know, 10 to the 16th uh, GeV and, and higher, M many orders of magnitude, maybe a trillion times higher than the current LHC. Yes. And just far beyond the the reach of even the future collider. So, is there interesting physics that can be discovered in this you know in this no, no scientist land between what we have reached with with CERN's LHC currently and where the FCC could get to, or is it just you know kind of a little because the energy scales is some very steep power of of the radius of the collider, right? So, right. <clears throat> um, or the one over that. So, uh, the question is. Um, 
can you really learn about the early universe? This is one of the criticisms I hear most. Uh, the real early universe was a, was a plasma, perhaps, of you know, quarks and, and weakly interacting particles so far inaccessible to, the, to at least the LHC. Is there really any hope or is it just, yeah, bigger is better. You get more energy, you get higher temperature, but you're kind of diminishing returns. Yeah, the answer for, for me as an experimentalist is it doesn't matter. And I know that's maybe like a provocative statement, but as an experimentalist, again, that's part of, partially what I mean by we're in the process right now after the Higgs discovery, we're in the process of recalibrating ourselves as experimentalists, exploratory physicists, rather than uh, being guided by a theory flashlight. Because again, those theory flashlights are sort of like, you know, they're kind of dying out and they have been for a while. Again, I completely love all my theory colleagues. I want the best, you know, I want the best ideas from them. I really do this. I want to make that very clear. I love all my theory colleagues hundred percent to death, but we're not guided anymore by the big kind of like, you know, big flashlights again. It's like, oh, there should be a Higgs right around the corner because of the, you know, because of the Z mass and the, you know, the top mass and all that kind of a thing. And, and we're not guided by, you know, the, the, the past where it's like, wow, we see this little enhancement there, should be like a wimp at about, you know, two GeV or something like that. And that's obviously not there, you know, at least at, uh, at uh, cross sections that we can, we can understand. So these big theory hints are kind of not so clear anymore. However, the big open questions still remain. So that requires us to recalibrate ourselves as exploratory mindset rather than, you know, it's like ex experiment first, theory later, and that it requires us to go back to just the bare bones, bare basics in terms of quantum field theory, in terms of, you know, uh, particle physics, general properties of particles. Um, and in that case, what I said about this, this slide here, of course, as you pointed out, is very, very theory based. The time part is not so well understood. And so the, and it's, and it, what actually happened before this kind of time, time scale is very theory dependent. So one theorist will have one idea, another theorist will have another idea. And again, as experimentalists, our, our job is not to you know, demonstrate whether theorists are guessing correctly. Our job is really to explore the unknown. That's really what we do. And I like to think of it, excuse me, I like to think of us as experimentalists. We're like cartographers. We're not re my job is not really to discover new particles. My job is to, is to map out all the possible places in data and parameter space where a new discovery could be hiding. And if I don't do that, I haven't done my job. As a, as, a, as a jump from, you know, so as a corollary to that, if we as a species don't explore places we've not explored before, we're not doing our job as curious humans. So, to, you know, it's, it's kind of a backhanded way to answer your question, but the, the, real, the answer is that really I don't know, I don't know who to, who to trust about what should happen before this time period. I mean, in a, in a very broad sense, as you said, if we wanted to get to the, uh, you know, we wanted to do the job right. And in fact, I have more slides about that too. It's, you know, I, I like to give talks about this, uh, this idea of building, uh, you know, a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system, right? To hopefully reach the Planck scale and hopefully not create a black hole to just suck in the experiment itself, right? <laughs> um, we, we, we confronted that a few years ago, right? We yes, were, well, uh, exactly. We survived the black hole potential uh, fatality. Okay, good. Yeah, let's keep going there. There will be some more questions, I think, that, that, the, that the audience is going to ask. But, um, just, just, but yeah, just, I think, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I think that I think that's fair. I mean, I, I often point out, as in my book, I point out a lot of the greatest discoveries were serendipitous discoveries in science. And, you know, in some sense, the Higgs, I mean, if you're not guided by physics, I mean, you probably would have bet, if not your life, you know, your cat's life, or, you know, uh, you know, your, your new, your new smartphone's life or something on the existence of the Higgs. It was so well established, it almost had to be there. And it was just really narrowing down, not where is it on the three-dimensional, you know, planet that we live on, the surface of that three-dimensional planet, but exactly, you know, the exact borders of that, of that uh, parameter space. Yep. But now we're, it's kind of things are wide open and without a lower limit, like we had lower limits on the Higgs mass, as far as I understand, we had upper limits. We really didn't have a great detection, like similar to the way we are with neutrino mass right now. We, we yep. understand that they have a lower limit we, from theory and from oscillation experiments. Um, and we understand there's an upper limit from cosmic yeah. experiments and collider experiments, but we don't know their exact mass. So that makes it a very delicious, delectable appetizer for, for experimental cosmologists and particle physics, because you know it's there somewhere yeah. and it is not serendipitous in that the way that the, you know, the neutrino was predicted theoretically or uh, yeah, came out as a consequence of a theory. But yeah. the um, question I have is, yeah, I mean, can, you know, counting on serendipity is often pretty risky. And so it sounds like there, I mean, can you say there's a specific target for an FCC or 
it's bigger is better. Again, I keep going back to that, that main question that I think about. Well, so okay. we have the same problems in, in cosmology, by the yeah, way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can give you my personal feeling, of course, and then I can give you the, 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 <clears throat> the, the sort of the, the CERN document, right, which has, you know, what, hundreds, if not thousands of my colleagues that worked on this to kind of like uh, lay out what the priorities are and what the possible things you could possibly discover mm -hmm. or measure are. And I don't know, I don't think we have time to go through all of them, but right. a couple of the things that jump out to me are, you know, the well, okay, let's start with the concrete first. So the concrete thing that everybody wants to know the answer to is also related to the Higgs boson. So we go back to that standard model, right? And it's sort of this, you know, this nice tight box with this set number of 17 particles and the way they interact. And we know that there have to be extensions to that. It can't be the full picture. There have to be extensions to that. So we go into and search, for example, new forces of nature that could connect dark matter to ours. This new force could, could be accompanied by a force carrying particle, just like they, all the other forces are. So we go in search of these things like dark photons or Z primes at extremely high, high energies that we just don't have access to at the moment that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And so that's one of the simplest ways that you can you can look for new things is really just we, ha we, we don't know what's there. We're out of big theoretical hints. And so we have to look, otherwise we'll never know. And that's really the way that what it comes down to. The other part, the real answer, the more kind of diplomatic answer, again, I'm, I'm the hardcore kind of like, you know, empiricist type, you know, person that's like, just show me, I want to look, I don't trust it until I look. But the, the other part is that the Higgs boson itself is not so well understood. And then this is, of course, you know, people that uh, that raise eyebrows about, you know, such a big experiment. They're like, well, is the Higgs boson really that important? The answer is yes, it is absolutely that important because it's the only, I mean, a lot of your you know, audience will know this, but it's, it's still, it's worth reminding ourselves what a bizarre particle this is. It's the only, it's the particle that indicates that there's at least one scalar field that permeates the entire universe completely. It's the concrete evidence that we have of that. And it's completely fascinating. And the boson part, the particle itself is, you know, you can think of it sort of like a little vortex in this field. It's like you smack reality just enough and it makes this little vortex big Higgs boson that then uh, decays back into the vacuum in a bit. But the whole interplay, of the, the whole theoretical understanding of what the Higgs boson is, is not at all well understood. And it will never be completely understood to our satisfaction at the Large Hadron Collider. And that's important because the Higgs boson, in fact, could be that one little portal or this sort of kind of like connection to this other stuff that we don't understand So, in a, in a very, very easy way. So the Higgs boson has all these kind of particular, you know, particular parameters within it and a little kind of intricacies. And we have to measure each one of those very, very precisely. Otherwise, we'll never really know, number one, whether the Higgs is, a, is the connection to the portal, you know, is the portal to new physics. Also, from a, you know, if I can jump ahead, you know, from also kind of an existential perspective, because let's, you know, let's be honest, those of us that do particle physics and we do astrophysics and things, the questions we're asking are extremely philosophical behind the scenes. You know, no one wants to say that. And a lot of like, you know, professors will be, get mad at me for saying these things, but really we're asking the questions, where did we come from? How does everything work around us? And where are we going? And yeah. the thing that's totally unknown <laughs> now is what is the shape of the Higgs boson potential? I don't know if, mm. if anybody wants to. Yeah, well, well, we should get into that. But before we do, uh, James, there's some questions coming in from Zavi and Brian, uh, and they would like to know, is it possible to build a collider in space? And if so, would a linear collider be better, a circular collider? How would it, uh, which, is, which is better? Well, to answer that question, let me go through a bit of my slides here. So again, yeah. this is kind of the stuff that I just talked about. You know, we jumped into the, we jumped, we did about half energy at the LHC, got up to another higher energy. There's dark matter open question. We can talk a bit about multiverse theory too, which I like to harp upon in my talks. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that we have new colliders. And so to kind of answer the question is all of these ideas for next generation colliders, they all have pluses and minuses. And that's really, that, that's the real question that's going forward. And that's the question that the European strategy was trying to answer. It was trying to really kind of scratch everyone's heads really, you know, really uh, terribly and say, okay, what is the best way to understand these questions within a reasonable amount of time and with, with a reasonable budget too? And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And this is not just some pig in a poke. I mean, this is, you know, the entirety of the European physics community and, you know, European related physics, physicist community comes together to do this collectively. This is not just like one person saying, I think this is interesting. This is everybody arguing, arguing, arguing about their, their, their favorite pro, uh, project. So the idea is that we have this, and this, again, I promise that I'm answering the question, but the, you know, we go back to the way, you know, it also relates to the thing you said, Brian, too, is like how, you know, how, how can we justify 
going to these bigger machines, if you don't have, if you run out of, you know, big theoretical hints, you know, these big flashlights, if we're out of those, how can we justify purely from exploratory purposes? And the answer is that it's always worked in the past. So for example, you can, you know, back in, the, in 1897, Tom can, Thompson could discover the electron by himself on a tabletop. And then we, you know, then started, things started to get a little bit bigger, you know, in the 1950s, this so-called proton synchrotron at CERN, 628 meters around, and then right now I'm gonna show like the relative size of these different uh, experiments. So you, for example, you had Thompson discovered the electron and now at the bottom you see what was actually discovered when you go to a bigger machine. So then we had something called the alternating gradient synchrotron at Brookhaven. And this was where the charm quark was discovered which is a complete game changer because it took this idea that what was inside uh, things like protons was not just a heuristic, but real. It, it was not just like a, a, a bookkeeping uh, technique, but it, quarks and, and gluons were really real things. Then you go to a bigger machine like the super proton synchrotron and discover the W and Z bosons right there waiting for you. And you go to the Tevatron, which is around the same size, and you discovered the top quark, the last, the, the heaviest particle that we know exists in the standard model. And then you go to a bigger machine, which is the Large Hadron Collider, and there was the Higgs boson. So this happens all the time. You build a bigger machine, you coax new things out of the out of the out of the woodwork that you can that you can study. And these new discoveries, we have no idea what the next discovery is going to be. So, for example, this idea is that maybe there's also going to be a, a, China, a collider, collider that takes place in China, the CEPC. Uh, this is planned to be made for the 2040s, and it'd be something like 50 to 70 kilometers around. And this idea, of course, that's what we're talking about now is this future circular collider, something like 80 to 100 kilometers around. But my idea is that you have to think about these things in the process of it, sort of in the history of human inquiry. These are not just, there's nothing magic about these. There's nothing magic about 27 kilometers. There's nothing- right. We're not talking about like a pretzel shaped collider, or toroidal no. colliders, right? No. It's, it's linear, circular, that's basically it. Yeah, it's e equals MC squared. You go as big as yeah. you can. You try to get the biggest energy you can so that you can hopefully discover new things. And so yeah. my, my idea is that we should, you know, build something that goes around the moon because then you, you know, the, around the circumference of the moon, because then you could potentially get up to uh, something like tens of thousands of TeV and maybe coax things into existence so you never had any idea. So the idea of building something in space is entirely possible. And so people have also talked about it very, very far future things. Like you could build like a linear collider floating in space between the earth and the moon or one of the kind of like, uh, what are those called? The, the special points, uh, you know, in, the, in space where, you know, the, 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 everything's really, really stable. So you could build one of those things. Um, th those are going to be extremely expensive at the moment. So when I give a talk like this, you know, about a, building a collider on, on the moon, the take-home message is I have no idea how much it's going to cost, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And so therefore, it's probably for a future, uh, future you know, uh, civilization, or maybe, you know, if we were to get smart, we could do it now. But, uh, you know, if we were, wanted to make some kind of ultra hadron collider, we could do it around the circumference of the moon. But the possibility of building something in space is people, you know, people have done you know, very kind of back of the envelope possibilities of this. And again, it seems very much probably a next century thing. It doesn't really seem like something that within the next few decades it could, could really be done. But I don't rule it out just because, you know, I mean, the, the title of your podcast, right, Into the un Impossible, right? I mean, impossible, impossible is only impossible up until the moment someone makes it possible. Exactly. That's exactly Sir Arthur's quote, which we'll get to at the very end. I want to save a couple of minutes at the very end to ask you questions uh, particular to you and not related to this FCC, et cetera. So let's keep going and I uh, hope uh, we can have a couple of minutes at the very top of the hour. I, to I hope ask I you some question. I'm not sure if I did. Yes. No, I think I think that was good. Yeah. And I, this image here with the moon, that's a very interesting one. To, uh, to, talk, to set the scale of things. Because there is, of course, an upper limit, at least to, uh, to colliders based on Earth and uh, other small planetoids. So yeah, let's keep going with this one. Want me to keep going past that? Yeah, no, okay. uh, keep, well, you can just mention this one though, oh, yeah. bounded so, by the- So yeah, if, for example, you know, the, the reason that I came up with this idea, you know, I like to give this talk at various places about a big bang machine on the moon. You know, someone, at least the good audiences, some really smart kid will say, you know, why don't you just build that like on the earth around Asia? And I'm like, find me one 11,000 kilometer circle in Asia that is politically non-fraught. It's not possible to do. And I think that with our interest, you know, there's a lot of interest in going back to space. You've got SpaceX, you've got the, the, the Bezos thing, you know, and it, it, there's a lot of people interested in going back there. So why not just really make it happen? Why not take advantage of people wanting to go back to the moon where they don't really know what they're going to do on the moon? So why don't we build a big mm -hmm. science center? We could do gravitational wave astronomy. We could do, you know, direct uh, observational, you know, uh, visible. But, oh, I don't know if we want to talk about that right now. But I, I wanted to go through, let me, 
very quickly go th through this thing. I'll talk about that in a second. So, but to really do the, the, the question, really do the thing right, I mean, let's be honest, if we really wanted to basically understand everything about particle physics right now, the big open questions, maybe not everything, but if we really wanted to do it right, we would just go to the ultimate energy beyond which our understanding of physics kind of breaks down, right? And this is the Planck energy. And if anybody knows the Planck energy, this is basically Max Planck took the, a bunch of constants of nature and arranged them in dimensionful ways and come up with these, these, uh, these ranges beyond which uh, quantum mechanics and gravity have to have something to do with each other. And that's one of the biggest open questions right now. How do quantum mechanics and gravity work together? And currently they don't. And we don't have any evidence of how they could work together. If you really wanted to do it right, you, by some very, very naive estimates, you would have to build a collider around the outer edge of the solar system, <clears throat> which I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon, or we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. Uh, but maybe you have a particularly innovative audience. So, you know, if anybody has any ideas, let's- Or deep pockets, All right? Or very deep pockets. <laughs> So that's to really do it right. We would we would want to go to a very very big machine, um, but again, that's 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 sort of you know again I like to think of it in in terms of the the human progression, the human curiosity progression. We have to look here, otherwise we'll never know. And really, that's I, I you know I hate to keep harping upon that, but that's really the answer at the end of the day. Our job is not to validate some theory. Our job is no at least it no longer is because we're out of those those big flashlights as to what to uh, you know how to build a big machine. And so we really need to go as big as possible. And as it stands now, something like a 100 kilometer tunnel is pretty good and it could be done within a few decades. And so that's, that's partially why people are, you know, why, why it became a benchmark and why people are kind of really pushing into, into that direction. And you can go through the, all the standard, uh, you know, the theoretical motivations. I mean, supersymmetry, for example. Yes, it's entirely, that's a good example, right? Supersymmetry, you know, as most people know, you have this standard model, which is all of the known particles, which is this thing here. And you pos posit that there's another copy of that that's over here where the spins have just been changed a little bit. So there's this, this last remaining symmetry of nature. There's a lot of symmetries of nature that, a lot of symmetries in our mathematics that nature either follows or does not follow. And it's not up to us to, you know, to say yes or no, we just have to test it and see if it does. And so we, there's this last one between bosons and fermions, it's related to spin. And there could be this other copy of particles, except we have no idea where their masses are. We thought, you know, back before the LHC, a lot of people were like, oh, well, could be some supersymmetry particles also around the Higgs boson. And in fact, that's one of the other main things about the Higgs boson that makes people a bit weirded out. So you mentioned earlier, Brian, that the Higgs mass, sort of like we had a lower limit and we sort of had an upper limit, but really there's nothing in this standard model to prevent the Higgs mass from being something gigantically high. In fact, at the Planck scale, there's nothing really to prevent that. You can, you can work hard and you can say, okay, well, it's natural to be a blah, blah, blah place, but there's nothing right. really to prevent it from being gigantically high. But we found it yeah. down, at the, down at the LHC, 125 GeV, that's really small. And it's in fact mm. really, really strange. So it makes us start to think weird things about the Higgs boson. And so therefore, you know, it's entirely possible that there are new particles within you know, a few hundred TeV that could explain uh, why the Higgs boson mass is the way it is. We don't know until we look. Very good. Okay. Yeah. You want to keep going? Yeah, please. So do you want to, sorry, you want to go keep going with questions or want me to keep talking? Uh, keep, you, why don't you keep going with your presentation? I'm going to oh. look up the questions and yeah, so, uh, let you know uh, if we have new ones coming in. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, so this is just a, I, you know, this is an article that we did in Gizmodo. They did a really good article about, uh, they, they had this interesting series where um, they're like the ultimate experiment and they wanted to ask uh, different scientists, what would you do if you had no limitations on resources? And uh, mm -hmm. you know, it has to be physically possible, but you know what would you, what would be the ultimate experiment? And I was like, oh, particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. And so this is a good article that goes into some of the details of there. And this is something that I think is you know it underscores the point quite nicely because again, what we're doing is exploring the unknown. We have unanswered questions, period, and we don't know how to answer them anymore. We have hints. There are you know a couple of maybe slight theoretical hints. But they're just not as strong as they were. So again, we have to switch our brains from the theory chasing mindset to the exploration mindset. And that's really where we are right now. And so for example, I would love in the future, you know, one of the things that I would love if we ever make contact with an alien civilization, the first thing that I wanna know is like, oh, did you, just, what, what was your mass of the Higgs boson? How big of a collider did you do? You know, did you discover, did you discover the X and the Y bosons or these uh, particles, these things that are supposed to demonstrate the unification of electroweak and strong forces together? You know, did you reach the, reach the Planck scale? These, these kinds of things. 
Right. What was their history, their world line to getting there? Well, you should know you're not the first uh, physicist to talk about um, solar system size scale uh, objects that we had on Freeman Dyson as ah, a, yes. one of our first and many, many uh, get, uh, frequent guests throughout our episode. We miss him dearly. How fantastic. So, yeah, uh, no, it's, I, I always, I very often get asked about Dyson spheres when I, spheres when I give talks and I give, you know, talk about these people ask, cause you get really, you know, that's the thing that I, that I, in fact, I, I find quite heartening, you know, so there's within the particle physics community ourselves, you know, people that are working on these experiments, we do a lot of hemming and hawing. And it's like, oh, what's the best experiment? You know, because kind of to kind of go back to one of the answers of somebody else, um, or one of the other things that, one of the questions that came up, you know, you don't have to do a circular collider. In fact, one of the other things you can do is a linear collider. Um, mm -hmm. One of the benefits of a circular, well, there's pluses and minus to all these, all these things, right? So when you have a circular collider, you can reuse the particles that don't collide because, you know, in the Large Hadron Collider, I mean, when I say that we collide protons, the picture you should have in your head is not like a line of ants going bing, bing, bing. That's not what happens at all. In fact, there's no way we could do that. Instead, you have two gigantic swarms of protons and they kind of pass through each other and overwhelmingly nothing happens. And these are not just a few protons. This is 10 to the power 11, 10 to the power 11 protons. And they overwhelmingly- What's the equivalent current in amps? James. Ooh, that's a good question. No, that's a, that's a tough one. So I would say large. It's a, I remember it being a large number, but I've forgotten exactly what it, it is. Yeah, yeah, I mean the cross section for an imageable proton that you know has units of barns or whatever, but yeah. barns are extremely small. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and right. one scale. So yeah, right, exactly. So, so someone's asking now, uh, is that Dyson sphere size is that really even practical? How could you get supply out there? Well, let's leave that to to Carter Chef you know, type two civilizations. But yeah. but one saying, uh, Kuma's asking why waste money? Okay, I'm not, not his words or her words, not mine. Why waste money on a bigger collider? And we don't even know the theoretical limits as to how much energy we need. I'm <laughs> all for scientific progress, but we also need to use reason and wisdom. Just my honest opinion. No, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a valid point. And I, I would answer that I do think that we, the, the, com the community, the particle physics community is using logic and reason be and wisdom behind this because for the reasons mm -hmm. that I indicated, right? It's like, anytime you've gone to a bigger collider in the past, something has shown up. And so this mm -hmm. is really, this kind of guides us as experimentalists that we need to just explore. We need to go as big as possible. And that is wise because it's always worked in the past. And again, it's, it's, it goes down to this thing where if we don't look, we'll never know. We will not know the answer to whether or not there are say, you know, 40 GeV, uh, sorry, 40 TeV squarks and gluinos. We will never know the answer to that until we bigger, build a bigger collider. Once we do know, whether, even if they don't show up, that's new information and it's a huge success. And that's the thing, it's like mm -hmm. the, the Large Hadron Collider, you know, overwhelmingly all of the papers that we, that we uh, publish like 99.9999% of them have been null results, verifications <laughs> that the standard model is correct. Right. And that's right. good. Every single one of those papers, we should have a breathless press conference about it because it's new information about the universe that we didn't have before. And so every single one of these is a gigantic success. So yeah. that, that- I guess it's always, you know, it's always ruling out. One question I have because, uh, and I'll assert my, uh, my moderator's privilege here, uh, mm -hmm. is um, we, we speak about big experiments and we say, um, we say that, the, that the, you know, expense of a project is gonna be a hundred million dollars. Uh, we're, we're usually not including the cost to operate it, which as a rule of thumb, the Department of Energy typically will use something like 10% of construction cost per year. So if you have a $20 billion, 20 billion euro uh, collider, it's going to cost 2 billion per year minimum. So if you run it for a decade, you're talking about doubling the cost. When, the, when I see numbers, we see numbers like 21 billion euro. Is that including operations or is that just project construction? In today's um, that's a good question. I think the 20 billion is, you know, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at that. The, the number that got quoted in some of the news stories. I'm not sure if that, if that includes some operation as well. I think it does not because, but I think that the operation is not quite as large as what you indicate here too. For example, I mean, I can go back and it also addresses the previous question, which I don't think we answered in, you know, sufficiently. Um, yeah. I apologize for that, but here's an example. Let me put it this way. So yeah, I think that you do have to fact, factor in the operation costs. And I think it's also related to, you know, one of the differences between particle physics and astrophysics, for example, or astronomy, right? You can build a big, you know, maybe you want to talk about that later, you know, the, the, you can have these obs observatories and they cost a certain amount to put up, but it's not so much to continue to operate, you know, it's very different for the Large Hadron Collider, for these collider experiments. But here's to put, sort of put these costs in perspective, because I totally agree. Let me, let me be completely honest. 
when you see a 20 billion euro price tag on something, you know, you should, on a science experiment, you should go, whoa, that's, that seems like a lot, right? Yeah. But <laughs> we have to keep these numbers in perspective. And so, for example, here's the LHC. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have these relative uh, costs that are, uh, you know, that are related, that are directly proportional to the size of the ring. So the LHC costs about eight billion dollars to construct, and it costs less. In fact, it's a lot less than one billion per year to operate. It's something like half to six hundred or seven hundred, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. Department of Energy total budget. This was a couple of years ago. is about thirty billion per year, and the NSF is about six, seven point five. And the contribution to the LHC itself from those sources is something like 170 million so per year. That's okay. That's pretty small compared to those those big uh, things. But it's you know it's non-zero, right? Um, and you know just to put it also in perspective, the arts and humanities get about 300 million per year, and it's proposed to go to 71 million and then down to zero uh, by the current administration. By contrast, the entire budget of the U.S. military is 700 billion dollars per year. Also, if you take all of the companies that are private companies that are current or even public that are currently valued at over $1 billion, something like, you know, they call these unicorns, these are $650 billion. So if we as a society valued scientific curiosity as much as we valued, uh, you know, making bombs so that Saudi Arabia could bomb Yemen, we would be able to... Or Right now, we could build a particle collider on the, around the circumference of the moon, and we could definitively answer, answer many of these questions now. Well, that's where we should combine, you know, these de Department of Defense type things, and we should get Space Force involved. I mean, <laughs> imagine if we have Space Force, James. You're you're thinking too small. No, I have, uh, a, I have a different perspective. We should cut this budget by about seventy five percent and give that money to science, basic science. <laughs> well, so that's that brings up a question. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to ask a question just before it gets too late for me to ask questions. And then I have a whole bunch of questions from my friends online. Um, <clears throat> so first question is that I, that I just think about is when I don't know if you were uh, what, what how old you are, what age you are, but I remember clearly on basically the first day of graduate school in 1993, a whole bunch of particle physics is moping around the sixth floor of Barris and Holly building at Brown University, go Bears. Uh, where I was a graduate student, along with uh, Jerry Gorelnik, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, you know pioneers behind the theory of what became known as the Higgs particle. I believe about those politics. I talk about it in my book. He was a lovely uh, human being, and I miss him terribly. But anyway, he was moping around. All my other particle physics professors were moping around because they canceled the superconducting super collider that day. Yes. And I remember thinking, well, what's the big deal? You know, now it's just whatever billion dollars it was estimated to cost. And now that'll just come flooding back into science and we'll get, you know, I'll get a bigger telescope out of my, you know, and we'll get, uh, you know, a, a telescope in every pot. Uh, of course, it didn't come to be. I was very naive. I was very uh, immature back then. Yeah. And so uh, I think, you know, a lot of the people, you know, most notably folks like Sabine Hassenfelder, who I've had on the show, she'll say things like, well, that's not really a good argument that once you throw the money away, uh, or no, once the money goes away from from one project, it it uh, it doesn't go into physics general. It's not fungible within physics. It's fungible within budgets for countries. Um, so how do you respond to that? I mean, the the fact is that if it didn't happen, uh, there are of course other uses for it. Uh, you know, solving different problems in science, not by deploying the particle physicists to solve those problems. I know, I know you don't believe that, but, uh, but you know, what do you make of it? I mean, once, once these things are canceled, they, it's not like there's some windfall for the rest of physics, so to speak. So how do you handle that where, you know, the money's not fungible, but on the other hand, it is a big price tag and you can always, you know, fund it if that's a word for some other project, like you have arts and humanities, et cetera, there. Yeah, I mean, I, two two answers to that. One is that I, you know, I, I completely agree that you know that's just not the way science funding works. I mean, you know, there isn't some magic switch that says you know all of this money that is going to possibly go to particle physics, it's going to go to some other science project, you know, either basic science or you know public policy project, something like that. That's that's not that's it doesn't work that one to one way. You're right that it does in some sense free up funds if something like this did not go through. So it's entirely possible the FCC at some point some people will decide, eh, it's not really worth the money. So let's, you know, let's let's cancel it. But that doesn't there's no guarantee that that'll go directly as you pointed out into other science experiments. And so I think that, you know, the the, the possibility of it going to other projects, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure what to, to say about that. Yes, of course, absolutely. The, the money could be used for something else. 
But in this case, it has a very, very coherent plan and it has a very, very clear uh, you know, uh, uh, reason to exist, which is to explore the unknown. And again, I hate, I hate to keep harping upon this, but if we as a species, if we give this type of thing up, we're giving up on one of the key things that makes us human, which is curiosity about nature. And you know, I can think of it in terms of it's almost it's it's almost bizarre to my colleagues and I when we see these um, these you know occasional sort of like news stories or quotes about people that are like oh it's too expensive and you know oh we, you know we, there's no clear plan and oh there's no guarantee as to what you're going to find it's like if you knew what you're going to get in advance you wouldn't call it an experiment that's really what it is and I think that the way that we have you know that we have accustomed ourselves to explaining why these big projects are important is it does a disservice to the truth behind the science itself. It's, you know, we can take a, we can take a, um, a cue from our uh, astronomer colleagues, for example, you know, the 30 meter telescope. I mean, you know, we can talk about the politics of that some other time, and I'd be happy to talk about that. It's very interesting. But to explain the need for a 30 meter telescope, what did they say? They're like, we need this so we can see things that we currently can't see. And that's it. That's it. That's great. And it's the same thing with a bigger collider. We, because one of the things we didn't talk about is when you go to higher energies, you're actually able to resolve at smaller and smaller distance scales. It's also a thing you get for free. And that's not based upon theory. That's just physics. That's just like reality. So if we want to resolve things, look at structure of nature smaller than say 10 to the minus 18 meters, that's why we build bigger machines. So in that case, it's like that. This is the just justification, the motivation for these uh, experiments. Um, and uh, the other part is uh, no. I think I co combined both the answers into one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit um, you know oversimplifying it to say that we need money for other things. Therefore, we shouldn't spend money on this. On, on the other hand, you could say there's only so much total funding yeah. available in the universe of ideas. And then you could further subdivide it. I, I'm speaking sure. behind me is now a Zoom background for a project uh, equivalent of the, you know, the final experiment in the CMB field called this Cosmic Microwave Background Stage 4 S4 experiment, yeah. which is a grand collaboration of costing perhaps $600 billion to construct uh, post-construction you know, of the Simons Observatory, which I co-lead with... Uh, about 300 of the smartest people on earth. Uh, I, I think I have to say, uh, I, you know, the best part of science is that you get to work with these incredibly clever, in my case, experimentalists and theorists and observers. And I always think, you know, as an experimentalist, we have to know the theory extremely well. We just don't have to create new theories. And so I think it's important as some people are asking in the, in the, in the comment section, you know, you should be guided by theory, but but also you kind of have to go a little bit, as, as we say, into the impossible, into the unknown. And how, you know, how do we know if we're, if we're going to achieve a limit of, uh, you know, of the capability of these colliders to really reveal something new? In other words, could it just, could, is it possible, this is you know, not putting you on the witness stand, but let's say we build it, we build everything that you're looking for, and we come up with nothing uh, in terms of like, we don't discover a new particle, we don't discover new forces. Is, would that be, uh, would that, and we have to, I, before I ask your answer, you know, uh, would that be a, a failure? I have to say this comes up in the CMB community as well. We have simply no idea whether or not inflation took place or whether the universe has cyclic attributes to it and would therefore not produce observable amounts of gravitational radiation. We don't know, but we're going to do it. Or we're building bigger experiments, but there's a limit. I don't think there's you know quite the appetite for you know a hundred you know twenty billion dollar experiment as a six hundred million dollar experiment. Still a lot of money, right? Uh, but will it? Would you say it's a failure? Uh, I believe in some cases, if you look at the question in a certain way, I could make the argument it would be a failure to spend a lot of money on a cosmology experiment if it doesn't detect something. But on the other hand we have things that we're guaranteed to detect. So it's a long-winded way of saying, um, uh, is it possible that, the, that a future collider, such as the one being proposed in Europe, would that uh, come up empty? And would you, James Beecham, consider that a failure in some sense? The Obviously, answer, technically it would be, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Sure. No, please. Well, so the answer is absolutely not. Uh, the, to qualify, to describe an experiment as a failure, um, to me, it has to uh, actually fail, which means that, for example, the experiment has to explode when you didn't want it to, or you know, the, the mirror has to crack suddenly into a million pieces when that was not intended, or the uh, or someone passes a gigantic electromagnet on all of the redundant copies of your data and it's all gone. That's a failure. But the Large Hadron Collider, for example, has only discovered a Higgs boson. But does that mean that otherwise it's been a failure? 
Absolutely not. Again, every single one of these papers that we, in data analyses that we do, every single one of them that validates the standard model is brand new information about the universe that we didn't have before. We literally did not have that information. And now we do. That is huge. That is gigantic. And as you know, you know, as a physicist, null results can be fantastic game changers. You know, the Michelson-Morley experiment, all these things can really, really fantastically change things. And so again, I, I, I have to like, push back and be the hardcore sort of like, yes, let's explore. And that, you know, just the fact that we explore is a big, big thing. However, to leave you with this, to answer in a more concrete way, the answer is that along the way, there are tons of things that we will be measuring. And these are specific standard model properties that we currently don't know about in the standard model. And one of the big ones, for example, is related to this Higgs boson. We talked slightly about how, you know, there's this, you've probably seen this kind of like uh, champagne bottle, you know, style potential for the Higgs boson, right? And it kind of goes like this and it goes up like that. And then the minimum is down here at non-zero. So therefore you get massive particles, blah, blah, blah. And that's really interesting to know. However, there is unknown information about that potential. That we, can pretend, that we can in fact measure precisely at future machines like these gigantic circular colliders. And that information could be that possibly this potential does not just shape like this. In fact, it could go here and then curve over on the edges at the very extreme. And this part over here could in fact be more minimum or it could be minimal compared to the thing that we see the Higgs boson in right now. So what that means is that we're living, our universe possibly lives in a false vacuum. And what that means is that it's entirely possible that our universe uh, in the future could, the vacuum itself, the vacuum of space itself could decay spontaneously, something like 10 to the 139 years from now, but it's still possibly en entirely possible it could do that. And it could suddenly tunnel to another universe. And mm. that to me is, and if we, and we, if we want to know the answer to this, we need to measure the Higgs potential down to re really, really high precision. And again, you know, are you, are, is, the, is that discovery going to make, uh, you know, a, an invention that makes your feet smell better? No. But what it will do is will give you a better sense as to how we, how and why we humans exist in this universe at all. Kind of the reason why you even go after things like the CMB, you know. Right. Very good, James. Well, we're coming up on the top of the hour. I want to have a part two with you someday, if you agree to it. That would be so Absolutely. much fun for me. Yeah. And uh, but before I leave, because we don't know what will come of the future in these uh, highly uncertain times. So I'm going to ask you uh, a question that I ask Nobel Prize winners, billionaire hedge fund managers, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners. I ask all my guests this. Uh, question, uh, and it relates to the title of this podcast, Into the Impossible, which you pointed out. It's one of Arthur C. Clarke's three famous laws. First one being, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Second one being, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. And I see you, and I see Sabine, and you're doing these <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, but the third one is, the only way to know what is possible is to venture a bit beyond Into the Impossible. Tell my audience something that you thought was impossible once, maybe as a 20-year-old, 30-year-old version of James, and then you went ahead and did it. And so it became possible by virtue of your courage and, and ability to go into the, into the impossible. Yeah, so, well, I'll just give you a, a personal example, for example. Um, so I, in fact, have a very strange uh, career in particle physics. I started out as a filmmaker. So I have a, a completely separate bachelor's degree in film studies, uh, you know, and just you know, experimental avant-garde style film. That's, you know, so I have like a kind of an artist part of my brain. And so back when I was finishing my, you know, my bachelor's degree in film studies, I was also at the same time obsessed, I realized I was obsessed with math and physics. And while I was making films, I was also secretly reading, you know, uh, Landau on the side, and I was reading, you know, Jackson, and I was reading Brian Greene and things like that. And I realized I was doing myself a disservice if I didn't study physics and math formally. So in fact, I went back to a community college and I did a couple of years worth of like a year worth of, you know, physics and math uh, classes. And then I transferred to UC Santa Cruz to do a second bachelor's degree in physics and math. And then I did a PhD in physics. And now I work at the largest experiment in human history, pushing the boundaries of human knowledge right to the very edge of where human knowledge breaks down. And that probably seemed impossible to me, slightly impossible to me about, I don't know, what, 15 years ago. Now it's mm -hmm. reality. Wow. Fantastic, James. You did a great job. Uh, thank you so much for having the courage to come on into the impossible, face the critics, face the, the, the questioners, and I hope the audience will tune in for a part two and what may, uh, may we do it soon. And I wish you the best there. Stay healthy, uh, stay sane, stay sanitized, and we will uh, catch up with you later. Thanks, James. Have a great day. Thanks for having me, Brian. Bye. Bye-bye.